as the oracles of God. The Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, 6, and 7 is God's instruction on how to be like him. But in the second half of Matthew 6, Jesus instructs us and teaches us why God wants us to be like him. We're going to start in Matthew 6, verse 19. It says this, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. See, this natural world that we walk through, that's not our eternal spiritual habitation. And natural wealth is not our eternal reward. We each have a soul that leaves our body after death. And that soul, that's the only thing we retain when we leave this natural life. We can't take anything else with us. Now that moth and rust, those are things that eat or consume away physical or natural materials. Every natural or physical thing decays or wears out or gets used up and must be replaced or replenished. Every natural thing ultimately perishes. You think of the, the moth, they eat clothing and other organic materials. Those things perish away even though we may have them stored away in a closet. The moth gets in there. Rust, various metals, they rust and corrode and decay away whether we uh, want them to or not. And that moth and rust, those can apply literally, as those examples I just gave, or they can apply figuratively. I mean, physical property, like houses or cars, clothing, or what have you, the physical stuff, um, they wear out with use. Even if it's not like an actual moth going in there and eating things or actual rust developing on stuff, they wear out. These things wear out with the use. Same with our physical bodies. As our physical bodies age, our physical abilities decrease. Um, even mentally, there can be a wearing out in the mind. We may have natural education or training that we took in the past, and it may no longer be relevant today. What we learned many years ago we may not even remember what we learned many years ago. Um, bank accounts. They can get depleted sooner or later. They always, like I said, the natural stuff always has to be replenished and, and regenerated. And that bank account doesn't get uh, regenerated. It just gets depleted. So all this natural stuff, one way or another, it does wear out and perish. And the scripture says this, labor not to be rich. Cease from thine own wisdom. When I'm speaking of the natural education or training, the Lord says, cease from those things. It's nothing wrong with having that, those things. There, there's a tool to be used. But as far as spiritual matters go, and what we need for our eternal spiritual habitation, um, our own wisdom, our own training and knowledge doesn't cut it. Wilt thou set thine eyes upon that which is not, or that which is nothing? For riches certainly make themselves wings. They fly away as an eagle toward heaven. That was Proverbs 23, verses 4 and 5. Proverbs 27, 24 also says this, For riches are not forever. Yeah, they don't last. And doth the crown endure to every generation? Yeah, you look back through history and all the, the great empires and dynasties that have come and gone. I'm sure at the time when those empires were established, they were very powerful, and no one thought they would ever fall. But passage of time, they have. They got replaced with something else. So that, yeah, that crown doesn't endure to every generation. Maybe strength may stand for a while, maybe for a few generations, but eventually it passes away. So natural wealth of any kind, whether it's physical or even a mental or empowered influence, these things eventually fail. They get used up, lost, forgotten, or even stolen. Natural wealth can be stolen too. We don't get to keep any of it in the end. Now, Jesus instructs us here that there's something better than what this natural life has to offer. So we don't lay up treasures for ourselves upon earth, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, 
where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. And what Jesus is talking about here is spiritual wealth, not natural wealth. Spiritual wealth does not physically decay. It cannot be used up, lost, forgotten, or stolen as long as we hold on to it. Because Paul gave instruction to Timothy and to the church when he wrote, that good thing which was committed unto thee, keep by the Holy Ghost which dwelleth in us. That's 2 Timothy 1, 14. So the spiritual works we do before God in walking righteously before him and in loving our fellow man, those are the treasures we store up for ourselves in those heavenly places. When the Lord here speaks about treasures in heaven, he's not talking about the visible arch of the sky, the clouds and the planets and all that. He's talking about a spiritual realm of God above and beyond the visible sky, the, the spiritual places. Verse 21, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Now this is the qualifier for us on laying up our spiritual wealth. Our heart can be turned away if we're not diligent to maintain a holy and righteous walk before God, if we let our spiritual focus slip back into a natural one. That's why I said that spiritual wealth cannot be lost or stolen as long as we hold on to it. If we let it go, then those things can be lost. But as long as we're diligent with God and we continue laying those things up, they're in a place that they can't be taken from us as long as we stay with God. It's only us that can allow that to happen. Lift up your eyes to the heavens and look upon the earth beneath. For the heavens shall vanish away like a smoke and the earth shall wax old like a garment. And they that dwell therein shall die in like manner. Those that have their focus on those natural things, the natural creation, they're going to perish in that. But my salvation shall be forever and my righteousness shall not be abolished. That was the Lord speaking by the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah 51, 6. So what he's saying here is we reap what we sow. If we sow unto the flesh, we of the flesh reap corruption or destruction. If our mind and labors are for the natural things which perish, then when we leave this life, our soul will have that nature and will also perish. But if our mind and labors are for the spiritual things of God, then guess what? Our soul will have God's nature and we'll be able to go where God is to be with him. There's a big difference there. The light of the body is the eye. Verse 22, if therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. Now Jesus is speaking of the eye of our mind or the eye of our soul, the vision that we have in our soul. When our mind has a single and clear focus on the spiritual things of the Lord, the lights will come on for us in our life, spiritually speaking. So that spiritual light in our life, that's the love, joy, and peace that comes from truly knowing God and truly walking in his ways. Spiritual light is also wisdom, knowledge, and understanding, understanding the Spirit of the Lord, understanding the Word of God by the Spirit, and also understanding what isn't of the Lord, understanding the nature of Satan and how to counter it. And that wisdom, knowledge, understanding, spiritual light is also knowing how to apply these spiritual things in our life. It's one thing to know something, but it's another thing to actually apply it too. And that's what we're, we are to do as we walk through this life with the Lord. Verse 23 though, But if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness? So that's quite a statement there. If the focus of a person's mind is on things that are not of God, in other words, they're on natural things of the world, that will be reflected in their life. If a person's focus is on natural things, their love, their joy, and their peace will not be full. It'll be very limited, actually. They may 
only have an inferior substitute for those things. Instead of love, maybe there's just lust. Instead of joy, maybe there's just carousing and reveling. Instead of peace, maybe there's just you know contention and strife. Or a compromise with things that are not of God. And uh, if a person's mind is not on things of God, then they'll also have a very limited understanding of spiritual matters. They won't know what is of God, and they won't know what is not of God. They won't be able to tell the difference. And if that's the case with a soul, in the end, they will not be able to be with God in the hereafter because they will not understand him or be anything like him. That's the ultimate problem with having a focus on the natural things. Can't be like God if that's where the focus is. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that you, and he's speaking to the Christian church here, that you henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk, in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God, through the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart. That's Ephesians 4, verses 17 and 18. So, figuratively and spiritually, darkness is ignorance. Paul wrote here about having understanding darkened and being alienated from the life of God. So spiritual ignorance is being ignorant of God and his ways and being alienated from him. And the greater one's ignorance of God and his ways, the greater the darkness in that person's soul. This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. God's not ignorant, not in any way. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. A person cannot say that they have fellowship with God and be ignorant of him at the same time. It's a lie. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. That's 1 John 1, verses 5 to 7. Having spiritual light in our life, we have fellowship with those others that have that light in them, and we have fellowship with God. And that's when the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. It's when we're walking with the Lord. So if one is not walking with the Lord, if they're still in darkness, guess what? They don't have that covering. They're still out in the world, and they're still a sinner in the world. A true Christian is not a sinner. They've been delivered from that.